Hello everyone. This podcast is the first in a series entitled Who Rules Over Us? In this series, I hope to explain to listeners how we are governed and who is doing the governing. Most of you will expect, no doubt, to hear me talking about perhaps the power of the government or of corporations and bankers and finances. And, for sure, these will be part of the discussion in one of the later podcasts. But in fact, an understanding of the true nature of what governs us requires that we look much deeper and further into the nature of all those activities going on out there. But to begin with, I need to look more closely at a rather esoteric topic, a topic that is highly relevant to the question of who rules over us. And in my view, it is a topic that is absolutely fundamental to understanding not only who rules over us, but to understanding who exactly we are. But I don't need to go into great philosophical debates in order to do this. At this point, I only need to talk about one issue, that of free will. Do we have it? This question is totally relevant to understanding the nature of our existence on this planet. And I don't think that I'm exaggerating when I say this. Furthermore, the belief in the ideas that I'm going to suggest to you will, in my view, make the world a much better place for human beings. So, this first podcast is devoted to free will. Do we have it? And, in my view, there are only two possible answers to this question that are of any significance, any other answers being both trivial and unlikely to be true. The first answer I call the hardcore answer, which is my answer. And this is that you don't have any free will. The softcore answer to the question says that, yes, of course we have free will, but our attitudes, our beliefs, our behaviours, our emotions are heavily influenced, of course, by outside factors or factors over which we have no control. For example, we know that Hormones affect people's moods. We know that people's cultures affect their beliefs. And so the soft core answer to the question states, yes, we have free will, but for much of the time we function on autopilot. That is to say, we are buffeted and moved by various factors, hormones, the culture, uh, the friends we have, and so on, uh, that we are moved by factors that are outside of ourselves. And so while it is true that we have free will, we are heavily influenced. But I want to start the topic in a rather roundabout way. By referencing two questions. 
One is, what about our souls? And two, if people don't have free will, then they'll simply just get away with doing wrong. And with much justification, they will say, it's not my fault that I did this. I didn't have free will. And therefore they would expect to be exonerated. So let's deal with the first point. The soul. Well, I myself don't believe that we do have a soul. But, even if we did have one, did we choose it? Did you choose your soul? If not, you had no free will with regard to the kind of soul that you ended up with. With regard to the second point, wouldn't wrongdoers expect to get away with their wrongdoing because of their purported lack of free will? Well, the answer is no. The fact that someone has no free will doesn't mean that they shouldn't be punished because punishment is one of the ways that we can change people's behaviours. And it doesn't mean that we don't send murderers to prison for a very long time, because society cannot tolerate murderers. So there is no reason to stop doing what we already do when it comes to punishment, and indeed castigation, just because individuals don't have free will. But it does mean that perhaps we should have more compassion for those who do do wrong, especially if they end up paying a heavy price. Because really, the truth of the matter is, there but for the grace of God go you. If you had been born with that person's genes, that person's biology, and you had grown up in the environment in which that person grew up in, you would be the same. And you are lucky that you are not a wrongdoer who is going to be punished very heavily for your wrongdoing. In short, people will still need to be punished, they will still need to be locked up, but perhaps we would recognise that factors beyond their control led to what they became. And in my view, that would reduce a considerable amount of hatred that floods across the entire world all the time, particularly in the direction of men. Indeed, if an alien from another planet came to our Earth, he would be forgiven for thinking that it is only men who have free will, and that women and children are not responsible for what they do, whereas men are. So it is an issue worth thinking about from this point of view alone. So let's move on to Afghanistan. A mother and your father were out there, perhaps they were doctors. You were conceived in, um, let's say, Texas, but your parents are out there fighting the good fight, you're born, and at the very instant that you are born, both your parents are killed, and you end up in the hands of the Taliban. What will happen to you? 
what will you end up believing? Well, I'll tell you. You'll end up believing in Allah. You will end up hating Americans. You will want to kill Americans. You will think that your daughters should not be educated. And so on. The very same genes, the very same biology, brought up in a different part of the world, and you will be a completely different person. Your beliefs will be utterly different from what they are now. The friends that you know now, you will never have known. You will never have known your parents. You will never have seen their faces. Not one single memory that you have in your brain would you have. Your extended family wouldn't exist. You would not have gone to that college or to that university. You would never have seen the TV shows or the films that you have seen. You would never have been in the classrooms where you were educated. You will never have done the jobs that you have done. None of your colleagues would exist in your mind. You wouldn't understand democracy or science. You wouldn't have been influenced by the liberal thinkers of the past. There is absolutely nothing about you that would be the same when it comes to your thinking and your attitudes. The women that you like, that you fancy, they wouldn't look the same as Western women. Indeed, if you were to see a photograph of Western women walking along the pavement in their short skirts, you might think very badly of them indeed. If you had been brought up in Afghanistan, the point is that you would see people and view matters in a very different light. Now, it's true to say that there are some common factors which humans all over the world are affected by. For example, the physical environment is the same for all of us, more or less, though of course climate and terrain can be wildly different, but if you drop a ball, it falls to the ground. If you put your hand in the fire, it hurts, and it will Burn to a charcoal if you keep it there. So, there is a commonality for human beings across the world. Similarly, all human beings are predisposed by their biology to move toward certain experiences, like perhaps being cuddled, having sex, having fun, grieving over the loss of loved ones, and so on. In short, there are commonalities between peoples throughout the world, but this is based on their biology and the environment. But when it comes to the issue of free will, once again, we find that those factors don't help us. In other words, they're outside of our control. And what is left in our minds is somewhat malleable. We can um, get Nazis to torture Jews. We can train our soldiers to kill people. The whole of our history shows that we can be saints and sinners. 
there's a huge amount of flexibility when it comes to what our minds do. And this flexibility, which for humans is large, clearly, is molded by the means and the ideas which invade our heads. And if you had been brought up in Afghanistan by the Taliban, as described earlier, those memes would be very different. They would, con be, they would contain very different messages. Furthermore, every single memory inside your head would be different to what it is right now. Not one image in your mind would be the same. Even if you looked at the same photograph, you would see it in a different light. Nothing would be the same in your brain. You don't have any choice as to what those means will be. And you don't have any choice with regard to the memories that you have. Now you might perhaps believe that you haven't got a soul, um, but you have some essence that arises from your biology, from the interaction of your biology with the environment in which it develops. You might believe that some kind of selfness, special selfness, not a soul, let's call it consciousness, defines the very essence of you. But even if this is true, you still have no choice in what created that consciousness and what entered into it as you started growing older. And my point to you here is you chose absolutely none of these things. Now you might say, well, you know, that's all right for uh, big things, but I have free will. I can move my left hand now, I can move my right hand. So you have a sense that you have free will, at least in these uh, more peripheral circumstances, but you don't. The evidence now seems very strongly to support the view that even when it comes to very trivial choices that you might wish to make, left hand, right hand, a computer wired up to your brain can demonstrate what you are going to do before you've done it. It can signal your choice before you are consciously aware of it. There are experiments now that show this quite strongly. But this isn't surprising, is it? Because we all know that what is going on inside our brains are billions upon billions of interactions, absolutely all of which remain beneath our consciousness. We have no awareness of those billions of neuronal firings. And just before you make your decision of shall I move left or shall I move right, it is all those billions of firings summating all the information and the evidence and the motivations and the hormones and, the, and everything, summating them all together, which give rise to your decision to move your left hand. It's rather like consciousness is the screen of a television, where the, 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 the screen is the consciousness of the television. The television hasn't got a clue what's going, on, what's going on inside of it. Neither does a computer have a clue what's going on inside of it when it projects onto a screen. Billions of electrons, and in terms of a computer, uh, billions of bits and bytes, result in a computation which then ends up on the screen. 
its consciousness. And your brain is no different. The evidence suggests that at every level, your consciousness is after the fact and not before it. Indeed, most of the brain seems to deal with information that is coming in from the outside world. And a further large part of the brain is devoted to organizing the body's response to the outside world, um, including uh, movement, uh, talking. Talking alone uh, involving language requires huge processing power to coordinate all the muscles in the tongue, in the lips, um, and breathing, and the vocal cords, etc. All of these complex muscular movements are coordinated by the brain, while at the same time tapping into the, the dictionary and the, the lexicon inside the brain to do with uh, language and grammar and meaning. A hugely complicated system. And so my point is that, and if you bear in mind also that the brain uh, lives inside a dark box uh, and that it sees nothing and hears nothing, and that our experience of sound and light, etc., are simply illusions created for us by our brains. Um, when you bear that in mind, and for example, the fact that I seem to recall, um, that I think the cerebellum, the part of the brain that is to do with uh, uh, balance and muscular coordination, uh, I think it has more neurons inside that structure than there are neurons involved in thinking. And so, all in all, and given that your consciousness itself, yourself, can only be informed, can only receive information from your biology, which you didn't choose, the environment, which you didn't choose, and the means pouring into your head, which you didn't choose, well, you have to ask yourself the question, well, where exactly can I locate my free will button? Where is that part of me that stands apart from everything that has gone before? What part of me is totally uninfluenced by my history. Where is it? How could it have remained unaffected by my past? How is such a thing possible? Especially if you believe that this part of you, this magical part of you, can influence your future. One would have to argue that the past did not contact this special part of you, while at the same time believing that this special part of you could influence your future, presumably on the basis of some secret knowledge derived from places unknown. But it just doesn't make sense to think that there is a part of you that stands outside and above everything that has gone before. And thus far, no such place has been found. Remember, even if you have a soul that makes you into the kind of person you are, you didn't choose it. You had no say in the matter. And everything that informed that soul, or that consciousness, if you prefer, came from the environment or from your biology, which you didn't choose either. Now, some of you religious people might say, Ah, but my soul is informed by my God. 
which I suppose is possible. But even if true, it is God, not you, who decides to inform your soul. In other words, the very fact of a God influencing your soul or your decisions is no let-out clause when it comes to free will. And so what we seem to have a picture of here is a brain that's living inside an environment in a dark soundproof box, effectively, because remember the brain sees no light and hears no sound. And that information which bombards the system is completely and utterly beyond your control. Now, I want to make it clear that it is not necessary to accept the hardcore you have no free will argument. It is simply necessary for you to accept that we have huge, huge dispositions to behave and think in a certain way as a result of circumstances over which we had no control. The question arises, of course, well, if we don't have free will, or if our free will is very limited, who's running the show? In other words, who rules over us? Because it doesn't appear to be us who is doing the ruling. And that, my dear friends, will be the subject of my next podcast. Thank you for listening.